you know, we're in the billion people in the world that are very, very lucky to have what we have. And I think the other 7 billion people in the world aren't going to move from burning wood to burning, uh, to, to, to windmills and solar panels. I think that works for the rich world. That's okay. We can pay for higher energy costs if you want to in the rich world. But in the developing world, the, the most energy efficient way of doing that is through oil and gas. And so why not promote the, the, the guys that actually care about the environment, you know, keep it in the ground doesn't make any sense because we need human development. We need the 7 billion people in the world that are underserved to come out of that and feel good about their futures. And oil and gas does that. And I think that's completely misunderstood by Washington, you know, even both sides of the aisle. Walk me through growing up and how a gentleman like you goes from Newport Beach to the uh, the desert or West Texas, Midland, Texas. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a, not a story that I planned, you know, growing up. I grew up in Newport Beach as a product of, you know, Orange County, surf culture, pop culture. You know, my uncle's in the music business. There was a lot of cool bands coming out of Orange County at the time. And I was a, a just a, you know, a kid that played tennis. My dad was a pro tennis player. He, he, he got up to like 20, 25 in the world in, uh, in 1980 and, 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 you know, won the NCAAs. And so I was a, the oldest kid and I just played tennis and kind of grew into it and ended up, you know, getting a little better and went to USC in, in, uh, early 2000s, 2004 to 08. Um, was fortunate enough to win NCAs myself in 2008, and that you know in that world that kind of opens up opportunities. So I got to play the U.S. Open and go pro. And you and I talked about earlier, there weren't a lot of jobs in in you know the spring of 08. So I think I had no choice but to but to go pro and play some pro tennis and and see the world. And um, then you know kind of went around the world for two years. I, I think I saw like 30 countries in 50 weeks, lived out of a suitcase and, you know, barely made any money, but, but had a blast and, you know, tennis went pretty well. So I got to go, you know, do a couple cool things like, like playing the U S open and, and playing the U S open twice, actually. Um, and that's how actually, uh, I got, I got my job at, at Citigroup. So backstory is I, I, I had a buddy that played at Stanford and I couldn't afford a, a hotel in New York on a on a tennis player's salary. So what was a tennis player's salary? Well, sa- I, you know, it's all <laughs> prize money, right? So 2009, I was 150 in the world in doubles, okay. 600 in the world in singles, and I made thirty eight thousand dollars <laughs> and had to pay for all my own expenses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you play U.S. Open, I mean, U.S. Open was probably like twelve of that thirty eight thousand that I made <laughs> that year. You can look it up. It, it's it's a tough. It's a brutal sport for. If you're not in the top 50, it's a it's a brutal sport. But um, yeah. you know, did a lot of good things for me. Um, but you know, luckily I wasn't good enough to keep pursuing it because I needed to get a real job. But uh, in 09, you know, I couldn't couldn't afford a hotel or didn't want to. And my buddy was there, and his dad at the time was you know one of the top guys at Citigroup, and so he was going through the financial crisis. It was a crazy time to be in New York, crazy time to be involved in finance. And I would play during the day and then sit with him at night. And you know, the last day he said you know, Hey, whenever you're done playing tennis, you know, give me a call and can't guarantee you anything, but I, you know, I can try to help you get an interview or something like that. So, um, I'll never forget that. He, he actually did follow through on that, you know, a couple, about six months later, stopped playing tennis and, you know, he helped me out, get an interview. And, and I always wanted to move to New York and, and work in banking. Cause I thought, you know, one living in New York would be a great time in your, in your twenties and two, you know, banking <clears throat> doesn't close a lot of doors, right? It's really good training. And, I was fortunate enough to get a job um, at a time when jobs were pretty tough in in banking and packed up and, and moved to New York in, in early 2010. Um, so I did that for two years, wanted to get out as quickly as I could. As, as you know, banking is pretty brutal for the analysts. Uh, you know, I, I pity them and all the decks that I see now at Diamondback. I'm like, that poor analyst had to work so hard for that deck. And I, I knew that feeling, but, but it was great training, right? Didn't close any doors and, and ended up then getting a job at a place called Wexford Capital out in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. And um, tennis, I think, was important in that, getting that job too. Um, you know, the, the head guy there is a, a big tennis fan. He's, he's actually had a couple, uh, couple other analysts that played pro tennis while still working there. And, uh, you know, they like that competitive fire. And, um, you know, again, just kind of didn't, didn't, didn't know what exactly my job was going to be there, but I knew that I was kind of the kid that could model everything. And they said, hey, we have these investments in this place called Midland, Texas. 
Uh, one of them's called Windsor Energy, which is now called Diamondback Energy. And the other one was called uh, uh, Midmar, a midstream plant. So I fly down to Midland. I start learning about oil and gas. I couldn't even tell you the price of oil at the time. But <laughs> um, it was funny. My Our chairman, our then chairman at the time, just drew on a whiteboard. Here's how a gas plant works. Here's how a well works. And he basically said, go model all that. <laughs> and uh, that, then I became the, the kind of the analyst on the, the Diamondback story. And it was a small private equity backed vertical driller in the based in Midland with a new CEO, Travis, now, now our current, you know, still our current CEO. And uh, I just modeled the business and, and luckily it went public in, in 2012. Uh, and that, that's how Diamondback got started. So that, that's how I got, got kind of down to Midland. And, um, you know, I think you want to probably talk about the early days of Diamondback, um, which were, were, were pretty, uh, pretty hairy compared to where, where we are today. I definitely want to talk about that. I want to talk about a lot of stuff you just said. Before we get to Diamondback, how at being 600 in the world, like yep. how would you describe how good Roger Federer or Nadal are? You know, like I play golf, so I can appreciate how good Tiger Woods is. You play tennis, so you can appreciate how good these guys are. Next level. <clears throat> Next level. It's not even attainable with the, the level that they like, that Could they you have, have won a game off of them when you were 600 in the world? I think a game. I had yeah. a good serve. I, I really, you know, I wasn't really built for tennis. <laughs> um, I think they called me tennis linebacker in college because I wanted to lift with the football guys. But, um, you know, I, you, if you have a good serve, you can get away with winning a couple games. But, yeah. you know, the funny stat I always, I always say about tennis is, Roger Federer, arguably greatest tennis player ever. What percent of professional points, you know, every point in a game, every game in a match, what percent of points do you think he won in his pro career? Like more than 50, right? More than 50. 63%. 53. 53. 52 or 53. So he he plays the big points well. Now, you know, he misses a ball here, misses the ball there, but he steps up at for all 30 all and he, that's when he hits the the magical shot so tennis is a little bit deceptive you know it's kind of like the golfer that's it that are so good inside of eight feet yeah. those guys are so good when they lock down so good all right i'm not gonna gloss you didn't over think it. i would interview you today did you you can interview me <laughs> this can go back and forth um 53 percent. so what it so like what was your winning percentage less than 50 or like 51 percent? like is the margin like the, the that margin tight? the margin's thin but they do it every time yeah if you win a set six three or six four in the men's game it's a, you know usually one break of serve well if you won those four of your five games by two points and they won their games by two points well they beat you by two points on the game that they broke you why is tennis a game where you see so many pros that can play at like 15 and 16, 17, but like no other professional sport, do you really see somebody show up that young in the sport? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's harder to see in the men's game outside of truly unique talents, yeah. right? Like Nadal was amazing at 16, 17. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, it seems like players have developed later, particularly on the men's side recently. Yeah. Um, but Nadal, that just shows you how big of a freakman Nadal was, yeah. right? He was... 16, he won five low-level pro tournaments in a row. So those low-level pro tournaments that I was playing, scrapping to win 300 bucks to win my first round, he just won five of them in a row and never had to play those tournaments again because yeah. he just <laughs> he just exceeded, <laughs> went straight into the challengers and straight into the pros. And so, you know, the true talents are those guys that just move up to the top level so quickly. Yeah. All right. I don't want to gloss over this. So he draws on a whiteboard. This is how a gas plant works. This is how a like, can you give a little more description? What did he draw and what, why are you, why were you able to just take that and then immediately start figuring it out? Like, I, I, I mean, I knew how to model, right? I was good at math. I knew how to model. Okay. I knew how to build operating models. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a visual learner. And so, you know, I didn't realize it, but there's this program that um, the gas plant was, was the first deal. And, and that was kind of self-explanatory. Here's how this comes in. This is what happens in the plant. This comes out. The drilling the wells and the type curves and all that, you know, I didn't realize that I was basically building in Excel what all of our engineers use, this, this, this uh, program called ARIES. It's like the standard program for all uh, engineers to use. So if I had just had a little bit of training, I would have probably saved myself a couple months on, on building that, that model. But I don't know. I was just fortunate to be a, a pretty visual learner. And, 
you know, I was also fortunate to be doing that at a time when the Permian Basin was becoming what it is today, right? Yeah. It was so early in vertical drilling, horizontal drilling was barely taken off, maybe out here in the Barnett or some of the gas plays, but horizontal drilling and oil plays was not a, as big of a thing. The Bakken was early, Eagleford was early, and the Permian, you know, which is kind of the sleeping giant, kind of rose up last but was out of all those prolific. plays. It was the most prolific. And the reason why that happened is because the vertical drilling still worked, it still made a good rate of return. You know, it's, it's, it pales in comparison to today's standards, but we didn't have to drill horizontal wells in 2010, 2011, because the vertical wells were working from a returns perspective. But, you know, as, as we kind of ended up testing some, some horizontal wells in the southern part of the Midland Basin, people started moving north. Diamondback was one of the first companies to drill horizontal wells in the northern part of the basin, which is where you have most of the stacked pay and all the zones. Um, and and when Pioneer, who's a big, you know, big competitor of ours now, but they were the big 800 pound gorilla back then, when they announced, you know, 20 or 30 horizontal tests that all worked, well, then people started paying attention to the, to the Midland Basin. And there was this little company called Diamondback that also had a position in the northern Midland Basin and was, was growing pretty quickly at the time. Okay. So, you land off the plane from New York. You probably get in the Midland. You're like, this place is amazing. You're supposed to land there at night. That's the <laughs> trick. You, you have to fly in. The, if you bring new people to Midland, you bring them in at night. Okay. Noted. Southwest Airlines <laughs> in the Midland at, at uh, nine o'clock at night. That's right. All right. Set up the company because you didn't work there originally. You went to Bison. Mm -hmm. So you your boss, who was it that said, hey, go run this company at 26 years old? Yeah. So at, at Wexford... Um, you know, I was the analyst in the Diamondback IPO. Diamondback goes public, and I was supposed to build a drilling company that was going to uh, build all the rigs for Diamondback to use. And at the time, we were doing a lot of vertical drilling. And so we built six vertical rigs and two horizontal rigs. And this was a company called Bison. It was also a Wexford. Wexford has a thing where, like, you're, 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 Entity won't get funded unless it's named after a ferocious animal. So we <laughs> we went with Bison Diamondback. You know, snake made a lot of sense. And Bison, we we built some rigs, and we're supposed to have all of our rigs 100% utilized by Travis and the Diamondback team going public. And that worked for like three months. But then horizontal drilling took off, and we didn't have the rigs to drill for these guys. And you know, I like to say that that's the first time. Travis fired me. He he let go of all my rigs, and I was this just this twenty six year old kid trying to run a uh, a drilling company. Didn't know the first thing about it, but <laughs> we had to kind of you know pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and 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 find some new customers because our main customer, you know, just let go of most of our most of our equipment. <laughs> so, but that was a good time. I mean, that was a good learning experience, right? We ended up growing that business. I worked at Bison from twenty you know twenty twelve ish to twenty sixteen, and we went from. Uh, you know, four rigs at the beginning to 14 rigs at the peak. At the peak, we were doing, you know, 10 million a month of revenue. And then in 2014, the Saudis flooded the market. And that was a crazy Thanksgiving experience because, you know, here I am, that was probably 28, 29 at the time. And we went over the course of 15 months from 10 million a month of revenue to one. Damn. And so that was probably, you know, the hardest learning experience, maybe outside of COVID, uh, for me professionally, but those experiences, you know, train you, you know, for, for the inevitable. And, um, you know, we had to let go of a lot of people. It was a tough time to run that business. We, we ended up getting through it. Um, but that, that was kind of my big, big learning experience before moving back to Diamondback in, in the middle of 2016. Real quick, what it, like, if you said the main takeaway from that experience was? You got to be decisive and make tough decisions fast. Yeah. Right. And I, I'd say the same thing goes for what we dealt with with COVID cutting activity, hedges, you know, what were you trying to do too much, trying to do too little? You know, I, I think a huge, huge part of, of our job or my job is, is self-reflection and understanding where you made mistakes and you learn more from mistakes than from the, from the wins. And, uh, those, those two experiences really resonate with, uh, with me and, and, you know, things that we could do better. When you uh, when you hear the Saudis flood the market, I think it's more just like a depiction of the industry. Is that usually just catch like everybody off guard, or was it like we kind of saw it coming and then they just did what they said they were going to do, or is it like one day we were on the beach and the next day the tidal wave hit? <laughs> I mean, I think that was a 
in 2014 was a huge shock. Now okay. I, I was pretty early in my career, but um, you know, U.S. shale was just taking off. You know, everyone kind of thought at the time, well, U.S. shale doesn't work below eighty dollars a barrel. Okay, well, you know, don't don't bet against American engineers and American ingenuity because we figured it out. We made our break evens a lot lower. You know, as a result of that, but um, you know, the U.S. was just growing too much, and I think the similar situation was happening and. In 2020, the, the U.S. production growth rate was over a million barrels a day per year for multiple years, and we were taking market share from from OPEC, and OPEC did, didn't like that. Um, and, and you know, U.S. Shale tried to fight OPEC for a long time. I, I like to say that U.S. Shale lost, um, you know, with some improvements along the way, which is why you have a today a much more balanced model for U.S. EMPs. We don't we don't outspend cash flow. We spend within our means, we return cash to shareholders, and we move kind of the decisions in, from a decision in the field to a decision, you know, in the in my office where it's how many shares are we going to buy back today or how many, how what dividend are we going to pay this this month? And it, it it's made a, a in my mind, a, a healthier business model for for US shale and, and oil and gas. All right, we're gonna table that and we'll get back to yep. it. Okay, so the the original company was called Windsor. And what, like, describe what Windsor was. It was a few leases in North Midland and a couple people. Like, how did that get put together? Yeah, Windsor was uh, uh, the original entity before Diamondback. Okay. And it was just a few leases, most of them around the airport in a place called Spanish Trail, uh, which is kind of the asset that that we, you know, founded the company on. And uh, it we would drill like six or seven wells a year. And you had like 10 or 12 people, at, you know, in a, in a, a metal, metal uh, building by the airport. And uh, that little thing ended up becoming, you know, Diamondback. And, uh, you know, we kept acquiring leases and, and post going public, you know, I was not working there, but Travis and the team did a lot of pretty big deals to, you know, get scale quickly because, you know, they, they knew that the play was working and, and wanted to, to grow it, you know, as, qu- as quickly as possible. Okay, we'll talk. Okay, so Windsor, you're in a little building, 12 people. Mm-hmm. I guess the thesis was we can drill... Uh, profitable vertical wells in the Permian Basin. Uh, then the process from turning Windsor to Diamondback and going public because it, it didn't actually happen exactly that easily. <laughs> it did not happen that easily. So uh, we were trying to get the company ready to go public in, in early 2012. And in April of 2012, Facebook tried to go public. And if student of history of the IPOs, it was one of the worst IPOs in history. Now it's obviously done very, very well as a stock since then. Yeah. But that deal, because it w- didn't go well, closed the IPO market. And at the time, Diamondback and you know was trying to ramp activity into getting a higher multiple to to sell that to the street to go public. Well, that works unless it, that only works if you can actually go public. And so we we couldn't. <laughs> You know, when when an investment banker tells you I can't take you public, you actually have to believe them because they will they will push any deal they can to get <laughs> to get a fee, and they said you can't do it. And so we were we were running too many rigs, uh, we're trying to grow too much, and we had to slow down. And you know, we were almost fully drawn on our you know bank line back then. And and you know the the secret is we tried to sell the company. I mean, Wexford tried to sell the company, and uh, we went out to eight people. And got zero bids. Damn. There were some whispers of numbers that, hey, if if you tell anybody, I'm walking away, but no formal bids. And you know, those eight people are all companies that have either been bought in the Permian or still exist today. Some of them you you would still know. So it's kind of a great turning point in in our history as a company, and as well as the basin where Diamond back then took off. And you know, after a tough summer of you know extending payables and working with people to hire people here and, and fire them here. We were able to go public in, in October um, at a $500 million valuation, you know, producing 2,000 barrels a day of production and, you know, 40,000 acres. So we just barely, barely skirted by, but got public at the end of that, that year in 2012. So that was 2012. You didn't join till 2016? I started, I started working at the drilling company while that was happening Correct. in 2012. And then come back to Diamondback in 2016. Um, the drilling thing was g- going to get consolidated in some other service businesses that uh, Wexford had, and and I, uh, you know, I thought I was going to move back home to California and get back to the sunshine and um, you know go work in real estate or something like that. Maybe I should have called you, 
<laughs> but, uh, you know, I thought that because we'd gone through such a bad down cycle. If you remember the end of 14 through the middle of 16, oil goes from 110, 120 a barrel down to 26. Yeah. And nobody thought U.S. shale could make money at 80, let alone 26. So yeah. I'm thinking, hey, I'm, I'm going to go start something, <laughs> something different. <laughs> And I had a, a a lunch with Travis Stice, our, our CEO. And at the time, I think Diamondback was a, I don't know, a $3 billion company. It had grown, um, you know, significantly, but you know, times were tough. And he said to me, he goes, I want to be a $10 billion company by the end of the year. And I need you to come help me do it. How and big like, were they then? Three. Okay. And I'm like, this guy's crazy. There's no <laughs> way, there's no way they're going to be a $10 billion company by the end of the year. So... I start in July of 16. They had just done a deal. The market's recovering a little bit. And at the end of 20, at the end of 2016, we end up doing the Brigham deal, which was a two and a half billion dollar deal. And if you add that to where we were market cap wise, we passed 10 billion in uh, December of 20, 2016. So I thought he was crazy, but he was right. And, uh, you know, that's kind of when we, when we really started hitting the accelerator and, and growing the business. Why did he want to do that? Obviously, growth is good, but why three to ten? I, you know, I think size and scale in this business is is has always been rewarded and will continue to be rewarded. You know, we're always in this fight for drilling locations and inventory and inventory depth and you know access to capital and access to investors. And you know, in oil and gas, it's always kind of been bigger is better, right? And and that means you you know get the attention of the big funds in Boston. Uh, you can get to investment grade, you know, credit ratings where you have access to capital through a down cycle. Um, so it's just, it's always kind of just been bigger is better. You know, you can't just blow your brains out trying to get bigger, but it, it, there are some big benefits, right? S&P 500, you, you have all this index buying. There's just a lot of things that that size and scale reward in, in oil and gas. Okay. He brings you on in 2016 and says the mandates go to from three to 10. The market's like kind of turned. What was your job? <laughs> Uh, he, so he called me a uh, vice president of strategy and corporate development. Okay. And he didn't have a title for me. He just made that up because okay. <laughs> Concho, uh, one of our, one of our big competitors across the street, Concho resources that sold a couple of years ago, had a guy, um, who's now a close friend of mine named Bryce Moncrief, who he was the vice president of corporate development and strategy. So Stra Travis flipped those and said, you're the vice president of strategy and corporate <laughs> development. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I, I was just a small piece of the machine. I mean, they had a pretty big, you know, BD team and and some some senior guys that have been founders of the company that, you know, we all worked very cohesively to to towards one one goal of, of getting bigger, you know, in the right in the Permian Basin. And uh, so I was just a small part that had a made up title and just kind of I started with a lot of the investor relations work, some you know capital market stuff. I and mean, at the time, right, we were doing all these equity deals to grow the business, and investors were supportive. Um, it's changed a lot since then, but um, you know that was kind of my job. I, I didn't, I didn't, I can't say I understood the business as well as I do today, but um, it was those were some fun times. Okay, so like if you just took the Brigham deal, it's like you bought it for two and a half billion as a public company. What actually happened? So. I know kind of how it happens as a private company, but mm -hmm. what is the series of events? How quickly does capital form and the deal kind of happen? Yeah, and that's a great <clears throat> story because it was in Let's December. It. it was the end of the it was the end of the year. You, you had had a pretty big uh, run of deals uh, at the end of 2016 for all the companies getting bigger because investors were just supporting it left and right. You know, we probably started looking at the deal early November. We probably agreed to a price, you know, call it the second week of December. But at the time we were a seven and a half billion dollar company with essentially zero cash on the balance sheet. <laughs> so we're like, okay, we got to pay for this thing. And so for that one, we, we, we high level, we did 500 million of new debt, new notes publicly raised. So we had to go to the public markets. <clears throat> First, you got to get the deal signed, right? So we were up all night for a couple of days, but while, in the background, you're working on the equity raise and, and, the, and the debt raise. We're going to raise a billion dollars of equity, and that's not guaranteed. You know, even today for a company of Diamondback side, that's not guaranteed. Back then, that was really ballsy to go out there and do that. <laughs> and we gave the seller a billion dollars of equity. So, you know, the seller had to get. We basically gave the seller a billion five of cash and a billion dollars of equity, but we had to go raise that cash immediately after announcing the deal. So, 
you're up all night working on PSAs for multiple days in advance, but then you announce the deal and you got to go sell the deal to investors, right? They need to believe that, hey, these guys know what they're talking about. This is a good area. It's good rock. What does it mean from a financial perspective? And so you immediately hit the market and, and raise the equity after that. It's gotten a little easier for us now with, with the size that we are. We often issue stock to someone and, and that doesn't need to be raised immediately. Um, and, and, you know, we have kind of access to capital on the on the debt side because we're investment grade and investment grade uh, is a lot easier to, to get bond deals done than, than the high yield land. So to, thinking back now to what how crazy that was to go do that overnight was um, it's a it's a fun story we reminisce about. How, how, how long did it take? Like a couple of days? Yeah. So we, pro- we probably agreed to terms on a Thursday and then we announced it the next Wednesday. But, you know, thinking about the timeline we are today, right? Next Monday is December 19th. Everyone's leaving December yeah. <laughs> 19th. Like you cannot announce a deal on this December 19th or 20th and try to raise money that day. So you, you, better, you better get it done before, uh, before everybody goes home for the holidays. All right. Real quick. Let's just from here. The difference between being a high yield and investment grade, like how that transforms a business. So describe a high yield business or the high yield um, grade that you had, mm-hmm. and then what changes when you go to investment grade. Yeah, so uh, it's all it's all about your credit rating, right? So it's you work with Moody's and S and P up in New York and and Fitch, and you work to say, hey, how credit worthy is this business? And so for oil and gas, a lot of that means how big are you, uh, how much production do you have, because they think that's a sign of you know how you're able to weather the inherent down cycles that we have in our business. So as you're small, you're high yield. And when you're high yield, it takes a day, it takes two days. You know, if you're doing your first high yield deal back in, in those days, you had to go around the country for a whole week to try to raise, you know, four or five hundred million dollars to to uh, you know fund that debt. And in high yield land, your debt is often due a lot shorter. So your tenor is a lot shorter, right? It's five-year deals or eight-year deals versus in investment grade land, you can go up to 30 years. So we were high yield. We we're trying to get to investment grade. We got there finally in 2018. We did a big merger with a company called Energen out of, out of Alabama. And that got us to the size and scale where we got to investment grade. Now, investment grade land is a lot simpler for the company because you can call up a banker and say, hey, I need I need a billion dollars of 10-year notes. I'm doing a deal. And that deal will be done. Launch at 8 a.m. You're done at noon. God, and they, you know, they they have all the contacts to all the big mutual funds and insurance funds around the country. And, you know, most of them know who you, they all know who you are, but they trust that your credit is money good. Yeah, they just see your rating. They see your rating and and they kind of do some credit work on what should your yield be versus your peers that are rated the same. And, you know, the beauty of investment grade land is you can go all the way to 30 years. You know, some people have tried 40 and 50, but a 30 year, you know, piece of piece of debt that's interest only bullet maturity due in 2051. You know, that's I'm, I'm worried about a lot more things than than 2051 today. So, um, you know, being that size and scale that we have today, we have that access and are able to kind of do those deals. And you're not as worried about market risk as as maybe when you're a smaller company, if if crude's down on the day and you try to raise high yield money, you might lose half a percent or a percent, or the deal might not even get done. In IG land, you're going to get the deal done, I and mean, you might lose a couple bips. But we're yeah. talking about bips, not not you know percentage points. So that's the benefit of being investment grade. So you literally just call up Wall Street and say, "I need a billion." You should have some use of proceeds, right? You yeah, should have we, some yes, some yes. reason you have, to do you have it. A but reason to do it. Yeah, like we did. We did two deals last last uh, year. One of them was the Firebird deal. Some guys out of Fort Worth. We, you know, they're now members at your country club or whatever their <laughs> their names are. But no, I know I know them well. But let, that, let's use that deal for example. So that's a one point five billion dollar deal. We gave them seven hundred fifty million of equity. They just took the equity, and we raised seven hundred fifty million of new debt. That new debt was raised well after announcing the deal because you just know that you can go kind of, as long as you pick a good day in the market, you're going to get the the deal done. This is a dumb question. You said you go to investment grade once you hit like 300,000 barrels a day? More more or less. More so or less. if you're a company that does like 250,000 barrels a day, there's like every goal at that company should be get to 300. Nobody just stops at 250. 
Yeah, you also need to try to work the rating agencies too, right? You can kind of say, hey, I'm, I'm at 250, I'm growing 20 or 30 next year, I'm on my way. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a, a, a little bit of a dance. cat and mouse dance with the, with the rating agencies. If you have like a higher oil percentage, you know, that has, carries a lot more weight than, you know, gas based on their price decks. And, you know, you, you have to, you also can't be over levered. You have to have like, you know, one to two times leverage and, and, you know, just keep working the, working the rating agencies to get there. That was my job for like six months after, after we got to 300, it's like, all right, now, now you guys need to do this for us. So, you know, somebody at every rating agency. Yeah, they cover us and, and, you know, we talk to them every quarter and you update them on, on what the business is doing and, and what your plans are. And, you know, if you're going to do a really big deal, you better kind of call them and let them know that a, a deal's coming. And when you're calling Wall Street for money, are you calling usually the same person every time or is there a consortium of gentlemen and women up there that you would call? There's a lot of bank. I mean, there's a lot of bankers that cover a company like Diamondback, right? All sorts from cash management to M&A to debt to our credit facility. So, you know, we try to spread the love, right? Because they, they, they make a fee off, off raising that money, but you also can't give the same guy a fee every time because then the other guys aren't going to, you know, work for you next time or sure. give you advice or, you know, work together. All right, let's go back to 2016. So now you're a $10 billion company. Then what happens? Then uh, the world starts getting a little better coming out of 16 into 17 and 18. Um, and in 18, we did a, a, a big merger. We kind of got up to like, I think 18, 20 billion at the time. And, and we were, I think we were probably 16, 18 billion at the time. And uh, we bought this company called Energen Resources out of... Um, out of uh, Birmingham, Alabama. So that was our first public merger, which is stock for stock, their stock trades, your stock trades. Those deals can go awry, right? Because if the market moves too much one way or the other, the deal falls apart. So that, that was a big one for us because that got us into kind of what I would call large cap, investment grade, uh, S&P 500. But the deal made sense because there was, you know, they're in the same basin we uh you know we had a little bit lower cost structure than they did so we kind of sell the market on synergies where we can run the business cheaper we can drill their wells cheaper we still ended up hiring a lot of people from from energen you know because at the time we were i think we had 350 employees and they had 400 yep we probably needed a combined 600 but most of the people that we you know we acquired through that merger you know stayed or or moved to midland and well maybe not all of them moved to midland but yeah. a few a few Distinct superstars did move to Midland and, and put some trust in us to to run the combined entity. So that that was a big deal. Why do you de- how do you determine whether you're going to buy somebody or merge with them? What makes that? Decision? I kind of call it public to public a merger, right? Okay. I mean, so if you're yeah, it could be a, considered a sale. You're just yeah, if you're but merge. if you're a twenty billion dollar company buying a two billion dollar company, that's that's an acquisition. But okay. at the time, you know, we were seventeen, eighteen, and Energen was ten or twelve. You know, that's a pretty big combined business and you're not, you're giving up 35% of your company to buy that company. So that's how I would call it a, a merger. How does that happen? You're like, okay, big company, same size, same basin, a lot of synergies here. It's like, if you're, if you're uh, buying a $2 billion company, maybe there's more control. It seems like there's more things to figure out if you're merging, I guess. Governance. Mainly, Correct. Right. What does the board look like? Who's going to be the CEO? Who's the CEO? Do you have an exec chair? Do you have who, which management team members move over. Does that yeah. all happen before you sign the deal? Or is it like, here's the price, we'll figure that out. Most of it gets solved before the deal if it's a big, if it's a big mer- public to public merger. Okay. And so you'd be you'd be shocked how often that holds up a deal from getting done. Really? Yeah. Like ego. That didn't ego hold up those pride, things. Or? But yeah, it's a it's a lot of, hey, I'm I'm in this seat. I you know, I want to grow this business, but I don't want to sell now. I'll sell later. I'll, I'll talk. Let's talk in two years. You know, that, that's, that's a big piece of the, uh, the song and dance on, on, on public to public deals. All right. We're just going to keep moving through the timeline. So, okay. so 2018, <laughs> you're now 20 billion. You've merged with Energen, your investment grade. Then what happened? Then COVID hits. Yes. Yeah, so we get through 2019. Things are going well. And this you is know. another big learning experience for you. Yeah. Then, then we have 2020, which, you know, for, uh, us, you know, I, I, you can't, you can't even describe how crazy those couple months were, right? You're, you, one day you're, you're going to a, a party and, and we're traveling and we don't come home. 
We shut the office over a weekend. And, you know, IT has to move everything remote. I, I've got an iPad, an iPhone, and some AirPods in California. And we go to the desert in Palm Springs. And that was my home base for, for COVID. And, um, you know, I, we, were, we were probably trying to do too much in, in 2020. We were trying to grow 10 to 15%. We were running 23 rigs. We were trying to return cash to shareholders, trying to grow our dividend. And we had to go from 23 rigs in March to five rigs in June. Damn. And, and, and what was even crazier is that in April, April 20th, exactly, oil went negative. Right. So we were running math instead of running math on, hey, should we complete this well or should we stop drilling? It was, should we not produce at all? Should we shut in our production? And at the time we had money to earn on hedges. So let's just shut in our production and take the money on the hedges and, and live to fight another day. And so that that was math I never thought we would be running because your 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 oil price was very near on average your operating costs. Yeah. And so we ended up shutting in 10 to 15% of our production. I think a lot of peers did the same thing, but it was funny because I had, you know, would talk to some of my friends and peers that worked at other companies and they're like, are you doing the same math I'm doing? And I said, yes, it's pretty, it's pretty scary. So when oil prices rise, um, oil companies are greedy, but when oil goes negative, are you guys not greedy? Yeah, we're not greedy. Okay. Right? So you're in not greedy territory at that point. Yeah. We're, we're giving it away. Um, didn't think it could go negative, but, uh, it was like one day, right? One day, right before expiry. So if you if if there's no storage, people are going to pay you to take the oil away and not store it. So are there stories of people that were paying? Like, did it, did anybody get actually hurt that day, or was it such a quick oh people got hurt? Yeah, but you know, one of our mutual friends, you know, that we know very well, ended up buying one of those negative contracts. Yeah, I think he saved it in his office, but he ended up selling it the next day for a positive a positive price. It's crazy. I remember that day. Uh, I think that was one of the only times, you know, I'm from California. Not all my friends know exactly what goes on in Midland. They know I live there. Yeah. But I mean, I was getting like, hey, bro, are you okay? <laughs> Texts from <laughs> all over the place that guys I hadn't heard from, girls I hadn't heard from in years, right? Yeah. Like, hey, man, hang in there. <laughs> it was a tough time. Okay. So 2020, we make it through COVID. The worst of it was kind of in the first three or four months. And then the market yeah. kind of started normalizing. Again, yeah. Right? You know, you look back and you say, okay, 2020 was the worst year in industry's history, or yeah. certainly from, from my career. Oil averaged 80, 38 bucks the whole year. So if you look at the average price of oil for all of 2020, is $38. That's not great, but it, like, it wasn't end of the world stuff. But you had a period in April, May, June, where you were, you know, on average, sub $30 average. And that's a, that's a tough, tough price for this business. Um, but we're coming out of it. You're coming out of it. You know, we start to complete some wells again, bring production back. And then you had a huge wave of M&A coming out of that in, in the fall of 2020. Um, you know, I think Parsley sold the Pioneer, WPX and Devon merged. These were mega mergers at the time. We were all small market caps, but big amounts of production changing hands. And we kind of finally got our, our act together in the end of 2020, and, and um, we did two deals on the same day, which is kind of one of the cooler things that, that we've done. It was a, a private deal, a company called GuideOn, and a public deal buying a company called QEP. And they, we, we bought them at the same time. They didn't really know about the other deal until the weekend before announcement, and we announced it on December 20th. So it was kind of announced on the day where no one's in the office, and everyone was highly confused as to what was going on, but it was the right thing to do. And that's kind of the Diamondback culture. When, when we can get something done, we're going to get it done. And we pushed really, that was the busiest 20 days of, of my career. And I'm glad we got it done. Those were two really good deals that, that have worked out well for, for us. Okay. Sidebar for a second. In, like in real estate, there's buildings coming available for sale every mm -hmm. day. In oil and gas, it's probably not there's there's lots of companies, but it's not like you can just go buy a building really at your scale. You're just looking. There's there's only so many companies. Yeah. How does a company or a public company or y'all or anybody think about deals? Is it just constantly seeing who's out there? Is yeah, it but waiting if it's, for bankers to call. Like I'm depends. assuming y'all are looking at a deal right now. How do deals start happening at your scale? It depends, right? I mean, if it's a private 
deal, it's usually private equity backed and they have a timeline and they want to sell, right? So those are kind of more- And they call you. Those are marketed processes. They call me and they call everybody. Some yeah. banker runs a process and calls everybody and you know it's an auction. But public to public's different because there's a, there's a nuance to it, right? Because they might not be for sale and usually it's not being run as a process. So you know that's a CEO to CEO relationship. Hey, here's what I think. Here's what we can pay. Here's what's going to happen to the people. You know, here's how we're going to sell this thing. So, you know, public to public is, is more art than, than science. And I would say, you know, the private deals usually, you know, are, are marketed and, and well known and out there. And we did one of each at the same time. And those were just two you liked. Two we liked at the time. Yeah. I mean, but, that, but that's, you know, inherent in, in our culture and, and what we do is, you know, it, it's not dissimilar from a real estate play. Yeah. The, the Permian Basin, right? We know where the Good Rock is. We know where Park Ave is. We know where, you know, Madison Ave is. You know, we also know where, you know, Mid the, the equivalent of Midland, Texas is in terms of, <laughs> you know, oil production. And, you know, the scientists are so good at their jobs now. And they, I mean, they can see everything below the surface and know exactly what, you know, maybe not perfectly how things are going to perform, but we know where the good stuff is. Um. And in, and when you're doing M and A, is it like in real estate? If I go buy a building, like it's nicer to have all my buildings close because economies of scale. But it's not necessarily. It's not like oil and gas where you're trying to drill two mile laterals right. and you want everything literally touching and homogenous. But does it make what acquisition targets are out there kind of more obvious? It's like, look, here's Diamondback's footprint. This is kind of their their market of buys, or yeah, it definitely makes it more logical. And yeah. I would say if you did something out of the out of that area, you probably have to answer more questions. Yeah, um, you know, we I kind of go back to that: bigger is better, economies of scale, longer. We're drilling longer laterals. Some people are drilling three mile laterals, four mile laterals. Dang. It's just a more efficient way of producing the oil. But at the end of the day, it's also got to be in a good area, right? Because yeah. you can drill a four mile lateral in bad rock, and it is not going to be a good project, but you know, a three or four mile lateral in good rock is, uh, you know, is as good as it gets. So okay. the, a physical adjacencies help with midstream too, right? You're moving a lot of fluid, you're moving oil, you're moving gas, you're moving a lot of water. You need those physical adjacencies to play in your business and also kind of keep, keep your neighbors, you know, on the fence line. Okay, we're just going to kind of at least get to the timeline of today, then I have a different series of things we'll talk about. Great. 2021, there was a bunch of M&A. We wouldn't be doing a good service if I didn't ask you, why did you, the, the whole market wants to know, why did you not buy Double Point in, <laughs> in 2021? We tried. Oh, we tried. tried. We tried. You know, your, your good friends from Fort Worth, John and Cody, uh, had built built that business through COVID. And, you know, they, they you know, they, they drilled through the, the down cycle and came out looking pretty good. And, um, we had just done those two deals in December of 2020. So, um, I think, you know, the competitor that, that bought that deal knew that we were maybe on the sidelines, but we still tried to get it. It's just that, you know, we got, we got, uh, we got outbid and, yeah. uh, I always like to say, I'm, I'm happy for my friends at, you know, at double point They they, they did a good deal there and, and, uh, I'm so happy they, they, they made a, you know, a good outcome, but I'm, I'm pissed that they didn't sell to me. <laughs> All right. So 2021, uh, we're not that good of friends, you know? Yeah, I know. Unfortunately. I know. Well, I you know what? There might be another bite at the apple <laughs> one day. You just never know. Um, all right. So 20, like 2020, you buy these two companies and then what's kind of the last couple of years look like yeah. heading into today? The, the business changed, right? Okay. And, you know, investors have been pushing us to stop growing like idiots. That was the industry. Yep. That was an industry thing. And, 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 and we got religion quickly. I mean, COVID's going to do that to you, but. We've come out of that and we, we, you know, there's still some growth out of the U.S., you know, production's recovered a bit, but we, Diamondback is not growing 10, 15, 20% a year organically. You know, we're going to grow through M&A and kind of keep production flattish, maybe grow a couple percent here or there because we're in a global business that, you know, the, the demand for our product is growing one or 2% a year. Well, we shouldn't grow 15% a year. So we've come out of this, you know, COVID malaise, you know, stronger than ever. I think the businesses are stronger than ever. You know, not just ours. I think it's an industry thing. Yep. And, um, you know, we've moved from grow at all costs to return at all costs. Now, maybe there's a balance there, but investors have demanded their money back just like, you know, any any investor would. 
they gave us a lot of money to grow our business from 2012 to 2020. And 2020 was a shock. So pay us back. And so we've moved to this uh, you know, cash return model, we like to call it, where production's not growing, but we're giving a lot of money back to investors every year. But that also means that there's a lot of room between the current oil price and the oil price where we start to freak out about activity levels or balance sheet or debt issues. And so that, that oil and gas is never going to be a safe business, but but it's certainly made it safer. And it makes some of these price swoons like we've had right now, right? We've had $10 of oil price go out of the market and I don't know, 12 days, yeah. <laughs> but it's okay. We're, we're fine. We're the still paying, we're still paying our dividend. We're still returning cash to shareholders. We're still making good returns on our, the wells we're drilling. And you know, it's a, it's a, it's, you sleep a little bit better at night in, in this new business model. And then I asked you, I said, do you guys hedge everything? And you said, no, we don't hedge. No, we, you know, we, we moved to a model where we buy puts. So it's basically like, uh, like insurance. Yep. Um, that's our insurance product. We buy puts that are $55 crude. Hopefully you never have to call on that. But at $55 crude, we still, you know, pay our dividend. We still have a good balance sheet. We still make free cash flow. And we're not, you know, we're not burning the furniture to stay alive. Yeah. So that's kind of why we've we've gone to that model. And if you just look at like the, you know, oil market's so reactive, right? It's a big trade. And, you know, if, if there's oversupply, that the price is so reactive to it that it's going to get fixed. High prices cure high prices and low prices cure low prices. And, you know, even COVID explained that to us in, in, a, in a more exaggerated way than I'd yeah. like to. But, you know, you see, if you see a million barrel swing a day in a, in a hundred million barrel a day market, oil price is going to move 20 bucks based on that. Yeah. And that's kind of what we've seen here the last couple of weeks. You know, there's U.S. supply is a little too high. Some of the OPEC guys are maybe overproducing relative to quota. Well, You've had a washout in oil price, and that, that's just how this this business works. Uh, if you talk to people about the Permian, they'll sometimes say, well, all the good stuff is almost done being drilled up, and then it's going to move out to the peripherals. W what do you say when you hear that? Is that like accurate? Is that more talk? I mean, I, I mean, the Permian's been left for dead 15 times now over the last 100 years, right? And it, it keeps reinventing itself. And again, I can't, I can't tell you how smart some of the people that we work with are. I mean, the, Diamondback is a tech company that produces oil. I mean, yeah. it's pretty amazing what they've what they've learned. Now, you could say, yeah, the, no one's going to have infinite inventory, right? Because you're going to end up drilling all the locations. But look at what we're drilling today versus what we drilled seven, eight, nine years ago, right? We were drilling vertical wells 10 years ago. The first horizontal wells made, you know, 500, 600 barrels a day if you're lucky. Now we're drilling, you know, full sections, top to bottom, row and column, that are producing 25, 30,000 barrels a day at the peak. Damn. So the efficiency is just so high. And, and, and also from a cost perspective, right? We used to drill those vertical wells, I told you, zero to 10,000 feet would take 20 days. Now we drill zero to 10,000 feet, then 10,000 feet out lateral in seven days. It's incredible what they what 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 you know efficiencies we've gained over the last couple of years. And uh, is there anything on the horizon, at even close to what fracking did, that would say there's some new technology coming that's going to be the new jam? Not that level. Um, you know, it's not going to be a completely new form of development. But you know, we're still only recovering about ten percent of the oil in place that we're you know trying to frack into in these zones, right? So even if we got recoveries to 12 or 13 or 14%, I mean, you know, even just 1% more would yeah. would do a lot and open up a lot. And, and that's the technology piece and the efficiency piece that, you know, I think is, um, it, it's understood, but you can't model that five years from now. So you got to make sure you have your inventory that competes for capital today, but you know that some things are going to get better. You know, as we move to the lower return areas or to the periphery, as, as you call it, you know, we just need to make sure that our cost structure and our ability to execute is at the low end of the cost curve, because then we will be a, a long time, long term winner in that situation. OK, you mentioned cost and then we'll just tie it back to to culture. Y'all are considered low cost or producer. How are you able to achieve it? And then in comparison to what? 
Yeah. So, you know, we get that question a lot. We're, we're, we pride ourselves a lot on low cost, low cost operations, best in class execution and transparency. And the, 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 the cost piece is a product of those early days when we had to cut costs so the business was not going to survive. And that survival culture, you know, resonates throughout the business. We, we still have a, a lot of new people that have joined Diamondback in the last, you know, seven, eight years that weren't there in the early days, or even the last three years that weren't there in the early days. But our culture is such that we, we push decisions down, very decentralized. We have a very low corporate type, you know, corporate floor, or corporate group, right? My, my finance and, and, and investor relations group is five people. And so, we, you know, we push money to the wellhead, to the engineers and to the smart people to produce oil cheaper and more efficiently. So that, that that's just cultural, you know, and, 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 and we, we didn't get this big because we, you know, had a bunch of buddies that wanted to sell deals to us, unfortunately. Yeah. We, we, we did it because we can execute cheaper than the other guy. And in, in, a, in a commodity-based business, the low-cost operator wins. So as long as our cost structure is best in class, think about it like a factory. If we build shoes cheaper than the yep. competitor, we should own more factories. And that's how we think about, you know, operating in the, in the Permian Basin. Well, you said when uh, it was in some interview, you said when something works, we implement it very, very quickly. And then you think of a big conglomerate or a big Exxon, Chevron, Shell. Y'all are just more entrepreneurial. Yeah. I, I, listen, they're, they're good at what they do, right? Yeah. I can't do what Exxon does in, in Guyana to, you know, build FPSOs that are offshore and drilling in 7,000 feet of water. But the reason why the Permian came back to life is that the majors left the Permian and the independents like Diamondback got started and brought that entrepreneurial, low cost culture to, to, to a new type of rock that wasn't always thought of as the best way to develop a resource. And we've kind of taken that and run with it. And like I said, like I said in that quote, you know, I don't come up with the ideas, but our job is to provide a safety net for the engineers to, to choose to make that decision on a risk adjusted basis. And if it works, we're not waiting till 2026 to implement it because it's part of the plan. Yeah. The, the plan can change on a moment's notice. I mean, I don't, I don't, oil might be down another six bucks since we started this interview. <laughs> Maybe the plan's changing this afternoon, but yeah. you know, the, the, that's the nimble nature of our business. And that's why we, you know, we're a 30, $35 billion company with a thousand employees, right? We, there's, there's a lot of trust amongst those employees and and culture is a huge part of that. When you started, you didn't manage. How many people did you manage? I was employee number 150, probably. We were at 150 employees. I, I, I don't, I think I only had two direct reports when I, when I started. How have you learned, like what, who, has somebody taught you or is this self-taught? Like how have you learned to manage people? It's a big I, it's responsibility. A, well, it's a big responsibility, but it's also a constant learning process. Like yeah. I, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm the best at, managing people it's a constant you know push to do better right yeah, i was president and cfo so well you, but you've, you've yeah done but well enough i was probably a little more controlling or you know early and and tried to do too much and tried to control too much and now i've kind of learned as you know as you move up you're, you're you should empower others to to do a better job for the for the enterprise and if you trust them to do that they're going to do a great job so I, I've, I've really tried to um, you know, get rid of res responsibilities. I'm certainly not involved in every, hey, are we hedging this day? Are we not hedging this day? You know, uh, should we should we complete this well or not complete this well? Th those go th they're the experts that that particular yeah. spot. My job is to, you know, continue to push them when things are going well, right? When things are going well, you got to motivate them and, and, and make sure they're pushing and pushing and pushing to do better. Because in our business, when oil goes up, costs tend to creep and yeah. Life's good, and we're going to buy this, and we're going to buy that. And then when things go down, you need to instill confidence that the business is going to be around. Yeah. And so I, I think my roles changed a little bit uh, as I've gotten in my old age. In your old age. My old age. Uh, it wouldn't be dumb to not at least get your opinion on uh, Pioneer just got bought for $60 billion. Um, How big was Pioneer when y'all went public at $500 million? I think they're about twenty billion. They they were always okay. pretty big, twenty or thirty billion. So y'all kind of <clears throat> grew at the same pace from actually that point on. I mean, they got to sixty and y'all are at thirty. Yeah, on a multiples basis, we went from five uh, five hundred yeah. to thirty. But no, they, I was saying you grew twenty and they grew twenty, except you started from. A we did a little on. differently. Yeah. yeah. 
No, I, I mean Pioneer was a big competitor of ours. I, I got to find a new a new uh, competitor to to get motivated about. But uh, you know, I, I think it. I think like a Pioneer selling to to Exxon or a you know Hess sold to Chevron. That was a fifty billion dollar deal too. I think it means that th- those guys have a lot of confidence. The majors in our business and what we do. I think it's a like a valid a validation of the shale business model. You know that it fits into a major's portfolio. Um, you know it means a little different type of competitor, right? I never spent a lot of time thinking about what Exxon does, but now now I do, right? They're they're one of our biggest competitors in the basin and um but they also have a pretty loud voice on on a global stage. So it's sad to see Pioneer go, but um you know there's still a lot of consolidation left to happen in this in this in this basin. Okay, I I I'm going to I'm going to eat my word for a second. You guys grew 60x and they doubled. What I meant to say was yeah, come you on, both man. went up 20 or 30 billion. <laughs> You went up six. And my point was, uh, you went up sixty x at that time. Virtually. That's right. That's right. Um, Not because of me, but no, I understand. But, but it's an incredible story. Been, we, we're kind of the poster child for shale growth. Yeah. Um, you know, two thousand barrels a day, like three thousand net boes. Now we're at four fifty net boes. Um. Do you think there's any chance that the world will love oil and gas again? Like, is there a way to change this narrative? Um, I don't think there's a way for the whole world to love oil and gas uh, um, again. I, I, you know, we, I, 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 I grasp, I, I grapple with this a lot. Like, what is, what's our problem? You know, I think our, I think our industry has a, a communication problem. I, you know, I, I, I think the reason for that is that we've. Every single barrel and every molecule that we produce is bought sight unseen every single day. I don't have to market our business. I don't have to say, hey, buy Diamondback barrels versus XYZ's barrels, but versus Shell's barrels. They're they're just bought. (laughs) So, you know, we're we're run by engineers. We're not run by, you know, good marketers. Um, So I think that hurts, you know, and, and, but you had some, some really good marketers in history, like the Aubrey McClendon's of the, yeah. of the industry that that did a good job promoting U.S. natural gas or promoting, you know, he wasn't as big on the oil side. But I think there's room for that. I just think there's room for it done um, differently than it's been done in the past. We shouldn't be apologetic for what we do. I think, you know, I think the U.S. oil worker, especially in the field, is one of the most underrated and underappreciated worker in the country. Um, you know, they're well paid, but those guys work their asses off. I mean, it is a tough business. You go on a rig, it's a tough business. And, um, you know, I I think part of my job is to try to motivate people to come work for a company like Diamondback or work for this business because we're not going anywhere. Like, I I don't care what model you want to run unless we invent nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, (laughs) you know, we're we're not going anywhere. And that's going to take a while to build anyways, you know, so if something that we've never heard of gets invented or never thought of gets invented, then then we'll go away. But until then, I, you know, I, I think shame on us in the in the in the you know we're in the billion people in the world that are very very lucky to have what we have, and I think the other seven billion people in the world aren't going to move from burning wood to burning uh, to 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 windmills and solar panels. I think that works for the rich world. That's okay. We can pay for higher energy costs if you want to in the rich world. But in the developing world, the the most energy efficient way of doing that is through oil and gas. And so why not promote the 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 guys that are actually care about the environment? You know, keep it in the ground doesn't make any sense because we need human development. We need the 7 billion people in the world that are underserved to come out of that and feel good about their futures. And oil and gas does that. I think that's completely misunderstood by Washington, you know, even both sides of the aisle. That's my rant. And most of those people, there's not oil in their countries. Right. So, I, you know, I, listen, if U.S. demand, let's say U.S. demand today is 19 million barrels a day. Well, if we start buying more electric cars or more fuel efficiency, it's really been fuel efficiency in the U.S. that has reduced U.S. gasoline demand. Well, then why not promote U.S. barrels going to other countries to help those people at a fair price. It's a great geopolitical weapon. I mean, I think, look at our reliance on foreign oil. It's gone, gone to, you know, it's, it's minimal now. So why not promote the, the guys that actually care about not flaring, not putting methane in the air, 
you know, go ask Putin what his scope one emissions are. You think he he cares what his scope one emissions are? You know, we, we actually are trying to improve this business. And, and that's not just Diamondback. That's all U.S. companies have done a great job trying to clean up our act on on how we produce these barrels. I can only imagine how clean the coal plants China puts up every week are. Dude, have you seen? Well, have, have you seen the uh, the gates of hell? The, no. <laughs> there is a there is a gas field in I think it's Azerbaijan that has been flaring for thirty years. Like there was an, a drilling accident, the rig caved in. It's a gas deposit that has been on fire for thirty years, and you can see it from space. Really? Yet, yet here we are, you know, yelling at diamondback for you know flaring a couple mcf a day you know in certain areas i'm not saying flaring is a good thing but it's all relative yeah you know why why does california import more iraqi oil than u.s oil why why is that you know well one you can't get it there so you have to go all the way around panama canal to get our oil to california in most situations oh there's no pipeline they don't want to build a pipeline okay so they take it from iraq they buy a lot of iraq iraqi and ecuadorian oil my, one of my favorite photos during COVID was the oil tankers sitting off the coast of California, just sitting in the ocean. That's not one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> that was a tough time there, brother. Well, it was a funny <laughs> meme. It was a funny meme. It's true. It's true. It was. We can laugh about it now in, in, in retrospect. Well, it's 2020, and we're heading into 2024. Actually, one of our peers uh, at Hess bought three tankers worth of oil and just filled them with their production. This was a genius move by them. They said, I'm not going to sell it. I'm just going to put it six million barrels in, into these three tankers and I'm going to sell it when oil's higher. And they made a fortune on that trade. Okay. Uh, you kind of said this at lunch, but you said this business is a trade. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you need to understand the trade aspect of it and the, the cyclical nature of this business. So, okay. What would a, then what is somebody that's not good at oil and gas doing if they're not thinking about it that way? They're just like, what's the what's the opposite side of that? Well, I just think, I think part of my job is to understand that, right? Yeah. I think on the technical team, it's not, hey, you know, what's oil doing? What's the geopolitical landscape? Right. What's the macro? I think part of my job is a se- in a senior position is to understand the macro. And, you know, four or five years ago, I wouldn't have said that. But, you know, we have so many people that are focused on, hey, how can I get that recovery from 10% to 11%? Or how can I drill this well in six days versus seven? But at the end of the day, you know, we allocate capital. And how are we going to allocate capital in a business that's very volatile? Well, you need to know when things are good and know when things are not good. And, you know, right now things aren't perfect, but they're pretty good relative yeah. to where we, where we are. So, you know, allocating capital in the field, but also allocating capital on how we have this free cash flow. What should we do with it? Should we go buy something? Should we return it to shareholders? How do we return it to shareholders? Should we pay a dividend? Should we repurchase shares? Should we hedge today? Should we not hedge today? And you know, I just think in this in this business, you have to understand that it it's is always going to be volatile and it's always going to change. And there is no way to predict what oil prices are doing tomorrow. No, anybody that tells you that don't don't listen to them unless unless they're in like the Saudi. <laughs> yeah. oil office because they they actually have control of you know if they cut a million two million barrels a day that is a dramatic effect on on the global market if you are driving a gold bugatti veyron in saudi arabia you're probably on the team that's yeah gold. you're in, you're on the inside you're on the inside yeah that's how you get a gold bugatti <laughs> among other other ways probably uh, <laughs> <way>. <laughs> But that, but that goes back to like how we set up our business. We've set up our business to be resilient when things do go south, yeah. right? Good balance sheet, maturities pushed out, not due during the next potential down cycle, you know, low cost resource. It's just, you know, you got to set up for that potential down cycle. Are you, are, are you seeing more investors come back into oil and gas? You've even seen headlines of like BlackRock and some of these, these big pushers of non-oil and gas kind of changing their narrative. Is, is there any more flows into the business this yeah, year? Yeah, I, I think it's more rational. Uh, you know, I think in 2020, you know, half of our call was about environmental performance with an investor, right? You, you have an hour call, 30 minutes are on, what are you doing for ESG? Now it's a question, but it's at the end of the call. Yeah. So it's more about, you know, market is based on greed and fear. We're kind of more in a greed phase for, for oil and gas, but I also think you know, not to be a cynic, we, we've done actually a decent job. 
Yeah. Like we've done a decent job on environmental performance. Things are improving and, you know, it's less of a concern for an investor to put money into the business. The, the fundamentals are becoming more important. Yep. All right. Um, they were really the last thing I was going to ask you, uh, which I probably should have asked um, earlier, but uh, it seems like Travis has had a pretty big impact on your life. He's, I guess, what, 25 years older. He's kept the team pretty young. Yeah. He's clearly like a great leader that's put together a team. I'll go ahead and say uh, you're one of his um, probably superstars. But like, why is he good at what he does? What What's there to learn from Travis? Yeah, I mean, sitting sitting next to Travis and watching his development and what you know he's done for not not just Diamondback but for the industry, he is you know we have we have a motto at Diamondback: stay humble, stay hungry. And I think he lives by that. He's yeah. stayed humble. He's worked so hard, you know, for many years at other companies and and worked his way up, but never had a shot at the the you know the helm of the company. And you know what he did for Diamondback, going from five hundred million dollars of market cap to thirty billion. I don't I don't know if we'll be replicated in this business again. So yeah. it's you know it's a pretty uh, a pretty pretty fun fun guy to watch. You know, also as he's gotten bigger and as the, the company's gotten bigger, he's the same guy. Yeah, and um, I think there's a lot to be said for that. You you, you have a lot of you know, bombastic characters in this business one way or the other throughout the years, right? So, you know, the the the, the quintessential uh, image of the oil man from the Dallas days, you know, it, I think that those are behind us. And, and Travis exemplifies what the new business should be about, which is, you know, we protect our people, protect, we work for the shareholders. We don't think we run, we don't think we own the company, right? Yeah. The shareholders own the company. I own some shares, but the shareholders own the company. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, he, he exemplifies that to a T. So he's been a, and, he, and he, he, he's, he's been smart with us and, you know, puts a lot of faith in some younger guys like myself, like our COO, like our GC. We're all pretty young guys and, and girls. And he's, you know, moved us up quickly and also been confident enough to give us a lot more autonomy. Awesome. You know, the decentralized culture is, is important. If we were sitting here a year from now, over and under, on eighty dollar oil, under. All right, that's it. All right, buddy. Thank you. Thanks.